estamos en el top. En un breves momentos voy a presentar a nuestro invitado de hoy, al doctor Michael Shermer, pero primero necesito darles algunas, eh, a decirles algunas cosillas. Eh, primero, al final de la charla vamos a tener preguntas y respuestas. Si no se sienten cómodos preguntando en inglés, pueden uh, preguntar en español y yo voy a traducir lo más fielmente que pueda. Si no puedo, me lo voy a inventar. Eh, aprovecho y meto una pregunta mía. El, um, ¿Qué más? Eh, en esta ocasión no nos vamos a quedar a cenar después del evento debido a la hora, así que si tienen hambre pueden pedir algo para picar ahora, que creo que ya muchos lo están haciendo. Tendrán de libres. Eh, el evento está siendo grabado como todos los meses. Pronto van a encontrar este vídeo en nuestra eh, en nuestro canal de YouTube y en eh, nuestra página escépticos.es. También podrán encontrar ahí eh, los vídeos de charlas anteriores. Por último, el próximo mes eh, posiblemente tengamos nada. Que me dan instrucciones de que el próximo mes no va a pasar nada. Bueno, que okay. el próximo mes no sabemos qué va a pasar, entonces estén pendientes de las noticias de RP en la página eh, escépticos.es, en nuestro Facebook y en Twitter. Y bueno, y cambiando de chip, uh, on behalf of ARP, Society for the Advancement of Critical Thinking, um, welcome to Madrid Skeptics in the Pub. We were very fortunate that Dr. Shermer was uh, coming to Madrid to attend another event and he was kind enough to accept our invitation to come talk to us at our, our uh, usual meeting place and he even brought his daughter Devin. Welcome both. Um, this is the second international guest we've had. We had James Randi earlier this year and we will probably have uh, some other international guests coming soon. I think this is very important because um, bad science, terrible ideas, and scams struggle very well across international international borders, and we should be doing a better job as critical thinkers to uh, spread our way of thinking uh, internationally. Um, I'm going to read this next part because I have a terrible memory. Um, Dr. Michael Shermer is the founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine and editor of Skeptic.com, a monthly columnist for Scientific American, and an adjunct professor at Claremont Graduate University and Chapman University. Dr. Shermer's latest book is The Believing Brain, From Ghosts and Gods to Politics and Conspiracies, How We Construct Beliefs and Reverse Them as Truth. It's a real time twister, so we're not native speakers. <laughs> His latest book was The Mind of the Market and Evolutionary Economics. He also wrote Why Darwin Matters, Evolution, and the Case Against Intelligent Design. And he's the author of The Science of Good and Evil and Why People Believe Worth Things. Dr. Shermer received his BA on Psychology from Pepperdine University, MA in Experimental Psychology from California State University, Fullerton, and his PhD in the History of Science from, from uh, Claremont Graduate University. He was a college professor for 20 years, and since his, cre the, his creation of Skeptic Magazine, he has appeared on such, such shows as The Colbert Report, 2020, Dateline, Charlie Rose, and Larry King Live. I'm going to skip the, the Jerry Springer show. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Shermer was the co-host and co-producer of a 30-hour family channel television series, Exploring the Unknown. So without further ado, here's uh, Margaret Shermer. way to do skepticism <laughs> in a pub. Because as I always like to say, these uh, life's greatest problems are solved over adult beverages. <laughs> and uh, I appear to be the only one without one. <laughs> However, unlike my late great friend Christopher Hitchens, I don't get better the more I drink. So, uh, well, I just thought I'd, uh, I'd tell you a little bit about what I do, uh, which is skepticism for a living, and in the process, just talk about how we know anything is true, 
Goodwin, um, and how science works, how skepticism works, and so forth. <laughs> there we go. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you join the Skeptic Society and subscribe to Skeptic Magazine, and if you ever come to visit, you can meet our dog. Let's do the up arrow key to that. So uh, this is just a little sampling of the magazine. So this is my day job, is uh, publishing, editing, publishing Skeptic Magazine. It's now online. You can get it on your iPad or uh, any of your tablet computers and at skeptic.com. Most, most of the articles are on there for free. Uh, so each one has a particular theme to it. We investigate all kinds of different claims. So, uh, and not just the paranormal. We're interested in, in, uh, in a lot of the sort of cutting edge borderland science as well. So like on the future of intelligence on the up upper left there, we wanted to know if people are getting smarter or dumber. Well, I'm from Southern California, so <laughs> I have lots of anecdotal data about this. But in fact, that's not the case. People are getting smarter. Uh, there's something called the Flynn Effect, after the eponymous James Flynn, the New Zealand uh, psychologist who discovered the effect in noting that IQ score test companies have to renorm their tests about every decade or so, up about three, equivalent of about three points, because people are just getting better at taking these tests. And there's so much controversy about why this is, but it's fairly consistent for about 100 years, three points every 10 years. So my daughter Devin's about 12 points smarter than me. <laughs> and you'll get yours later. <laughs> and we did one on uh, artificial intelligence. When will humans, when will computers achieve human level intelligence? And we concluded that we're five years away and always will be. <laughs> it's a really hard problem to solve. Remember Watson, the IBM computer that won Jeopardy, the game show Jeopardy in America? This was a huge news story in America. But do you think Watson knows that he won Jeopardy? <laughs> Did Watson think, yes, I won, oh yes. <laughs> of course, he has no self-awareness. We don't really even know how that happens, how self-awareness comes about, and how you would even program that into a computer. So, so far, we're a long ways from that. So we're skeptical, for example, of Ray Kurzweil and his singularity is near theory. Uh, he thinks it's 2030, that once you, if you can live to 2030, you can live forever. Because by then, the, the technologies will be such that you can make it another 50 years, or another 100 years, and by then you'll be able to make 500 years, and by then you can make 10,000 years, and so on, you can live, live forever. I'm always skeptical when the prophet says, immortality is coming now, in my generation. They never say, we're going to do this big thing in 237 years after me. They never say that. It's always now. So I'm always skeptical when I hear that. Uh, however, as I told Ray when I met him, I'm going to be so pissed if you do this right after I die. <laughs> that everybody after me lives forever. And we're the last generation. Uh, we did one on 9-11 conspiracies. Was 9-11 a conspiracy? Yes, it was, actually. We concluded that it was. By definition, 19 members of Al-Qaeda plotting to fly planes in the buildings without telling us ahead of time constitutes a conspiracy. <laughs> but of course, that's not what the 9-11 truthers think. They think it was an inside job by the Bush administration. Anyway, we lined up all our claims. You can go on skeptic.com and just, uh, just type in 9-11, and you'll see the all their arguments, the 20 different arguments and the answers we have to them. But in short, you know how we know that the U.S. government did not orchestrate 9-11? Because it worked. <laughs> <laughs> we do a lot on global climate change, global warming. Those are paintings of polar bears, not pictures. And, uh, well, because there are uh, global warming skeptics. So the question is, are you a global warming skeptic, or are you skeptical of the global warming skeptics, which makes you a believer? <laughs> so the word skeptic is not clear. It's not something that's defined consistently, you always believe, or you always doubt, or whatever, or you're cynical. It, it's just, it depends on the particular claim under question, what the evidence is, uh, and so skeptics believe all sorts of things. We believe in the theory of evolution. We believe in the theory of the Big Bang. We believe in the germ theory. Uh, we believe vaccines are good, not bad, and so on. So there's lots of things that 
skeptics believe because science has evidence for it. So in every case, it's always a question of, is it true or not? It might be, it might not be. Some conspiracies really are true. Abraham Lincoln was assassinated by a conspiracy. It was an assassination conspiracy that started the First World War. Watergate was a conspiracy. So there's lots of conspiracies that happen, but but some of them aren't true. So you have to take them one by one. And finally, none of that matters because on December 21st, just weeks away, <laughs> the world is coming to an end. So you're doing the right thing. Eat, drink, and be merry for the end of the day. <laughs> So what we're doing, in, so Skeptic is a science magazine. Skepticism is just science. Science, scientists are skeptics. Uh, and, and in all cases, uh, we're looking for natural explanations for natural phenomena. So, and we always ask the what's more likely question. That aliens traversed the vast distances of interstellar space and landed in Farmer Bob's field in Puckerbrush, Kansas to make a crop circle that says skeptic.com? <laughs> or that somebody just made that slide up for me? Or, in the next one, before we say something is out of this world, let's first make sure that it's not in this world. <laughs> and again, we can ask the what's more likely question that aliens traverse vast instances of interstellar space and landed in Sacramento, California to help the governor govern the great state of California where I live, or that the World Weekly News just makes stuff up. <laughs> or are aliens coming to Earth? Are UFOs their spacecraft? Well, again, we can ask the what's more likely question on the quality of the evidence. For example, Here's a UFO that was taken uh, from my house in Altadena, California, in Southern California. There it is stuff from Pasadena. Go to the next slide. Uh, there it is hovering just above downtown Los Angeles. You can see the buildings of downtown Los Angeles there. Here's another one. Now, if it looks suspiciously like a hubcap, <laughs> that's because that's what it was. So Devin and I were, were filming a TV show on how to fake your own UFO photograph, so I'm just off to the side tossing hubcaps and she's making photographs of them. The next one. This is a nice one because uh, the sun was going down and the sunlight sort of caught the gleam of it. So, you know, I can make up a story about, you know, the rocket engine and the anti-gravity uh, something or other. Uh, this is a nice one. This is our mountains behind our house, uh, the San Gabriel Mountains where Mount Wilson's located. And this is just a little toy. It's about that big. And I just have a fishing line and one of those uh, tree whacking uh, saws that are like 12 feet long. You just hang it and dangle it. And it's dangling over the, the mountains there. Uh, here's another great way to do it. You get a big piece of glass and uh, and, and so the next one, you take some coins and you put a double <laughs> It's best to have like one big coin and two small ones that look like the mothership. And <laughs> the UFOs always seem to hover in triangles, so. And, and so that, that's a UFO sighting over downtown Los Angeles. The invasion of Los Angeles. <laughs> so I want to believe, we all want to believe, it'd be great if, if it was true that aliens have come to Earth. I mean, this would be a spectacular. Discovery, but I also want to know what's actually true. I, I don't want to just believe, I, I want to actually know what the truth is. So this is what my latest book is about, The Believing Brain, how beliefs are formed and defended as truths once you're committed to the belief of all sorts. And so it begins with the premise that the brain is a belief engine. Uh, we're pattern-seeking primates. We connect the dots. A appears to be connected to B. If it's Pavlov's dog, which you're familiar with in the upper left corner there, we get ring the bell, give him some food, and he salivates. You ring the bell, he gives him some food, and he salivates. And you ring the bell, and he just salivates. He's learned, classical conditioning, to associate A, the bell, with B, the food, and he has the appropriate response. And, uh, or if it's Skinner's rat in the, in the Skinner's box there where he learns to press the bar, and a little pellet comes down the tube there. Now, they don't know, they're not, they didn't evolve to know about bars. But you put them in the box, and they run around uh, pretty actively because you haven't fed them since yesterday. This is how it works. <laughs> With 101, Psych 101 students, you just give them a choice between a really boring paper where they can participate in an experiment. So that's how you get human subjects. <laughs> You're not allowed to starve them, so. Uh, anyway, so you, every time he gets close to the bar, you just, uh, you just elect electrically give him a, a pellet. There's just a little switch that drops the pellet into the little cage there. 
And uh, so he just learns fairly quickly that he just has to get close to it, then you make him actually bump up against it, then you make him touch it, then you make him touch it hard enough to close the electrical switch, the pellet comes down. So that's called shaping. It takes about 20 to 30 minutes for the hungry rat to do. And, uh, and, and that's, so that's called operant condition. But these are both forms of association learning. It's just connecting A to B. So this is what all animals do from C. elegans to H. sapiens. It's what our brains are wired up to do. <coughs> so if you want to know uh, what, what it used to look like when I did this back in the Devonian, uh, this is a lab from the 1970s that when we were running pigeons and rats. And that was a high-tech computer at the time. It took up about half the room. Now, a lot of you won't recognize these, but, but these were called pencils. <laughs> And those were actually lined data sheets that we made. Anyway. Uh, and that was one of our pigeons. We were training him to peck the left key or the right key and rewarded him twice as often for pressing the left key than the right key. Test the matching law. Don't worry about it. But what, what it turns out you can do is that a, a new pigeon you stick in there, if you just randomly give him reinforcement, whatever he happened to be doing just before he got rewarded, he repeats that. So maybe he does a does a little pirouette because they're active in there, and he turns around twice to the left and he gets a, he gets a little feed. So he repeats that behavior. I mean, by, by definition, a reinforcement is anything that causes the organism to repeat its behavior, by definition. So that's called superstition. That's magical thinking. That's connecting A to B, even though there's no connection at all. And if you think that's just a product of having a bird brain, you should go to Las Vegas, Nevada. <laughs> and you will see lots of big brains with the same process because all of our brains do the same sort of thing. And as a Skinner discovered that in the 50s, it's been tested many times since then, that's just superstition. So I call this whole process patternicity, the tendency to find meaningful patterns in both meaningful and meaningless noise. So it's not an error in cognition, it's not a problem uh, with the brain, it's not some problem with education or literacy or anything like that. Our brains are just wired up to find all sorts of patterns. And, uh, so, and, and we make mistakes. So type 1 errors or false positives. You think A is connected to B, uh, and it's not. But believing the pattern is real, but it isn't. Or a type 2 error, false negative, is not believing a pattern is real, but it is. So not recognizing a real pattern. So here's our thought experiment for the night. So imagine you're a hominid on the plains of Africa three and a half million years ago. You're a little Australopithecine Africanus and your name is Lucy. <laughs> yeah, me <the> Lucy. <laughs> and uh, there's a famous Gary Larson cartoon with a couple of cave dwellers at a party, a cave party, and the guy saying to her, you're not the Lucy, are you? <laughs> like that was me three and a half million years ago. Anyway. Anyway, so you're a hominid on the plains of Africa three and a half million years ago, and you, hear a hum and you hear a rustle in the grass. Is it a dangerous predator, or is it just the wind? Well, if you think it's a dangerous predator, and it turns out it's just the wind, that's a type 1 error, a false positive. You thought, A, the wind was connected to B, the predator, and it's not. But that's a low-cost error to make, no problem. <laughs> you just become skittish and cautious and careful. But if you think that the rustle in the grass is just the wind, and it turns out it's a dangerous predator, your lunch. <laughs> Congratulations, you've been given a Darwin Award for taking yourself out of the <laughs> before reproducing. That's <laughs> why well, I like the Darwin Awards. <laughs> Way to improve the species anyway. So, uh, so basically, uh, pattern disease occur whenever the cost of making a type 1 error is less than the cost of making a type 2 error. Now, why can't, why can't you just wait in the grass and collect more data? because that, too, will get you lunch, make you lunch. Uh, because predators are designed, sorry, they evolved. Hard not to use that word. <laughs> well, they were designed by natural selection uh, to uh, not wait around for prey. That's why they stalk their prey and pounce as quickly as possible, right? Don't give them more data time to collect data. Therefore, uh, this problem of assessing the difference between type 1 and type 2 errors is too problematic. There's no time. So you just have to make uh, a, uh, what's called a, a sort of a, a, a rule of thumb or a, a cognitive heuristic. Uh, just a default position, assume that all rustles in the grass are dangerous predators, but not the wind, just in case. And therefore, we are the evolved. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> there, therefore, I'm, I'm making an evolutionary argument that it's a, it's a, simply a byproduct of the way the brain works. 
will always have superstitious, magical thinking. I'll always have job security, uh, debunking nonsense, because there'll always be nonsense. That, now, th there is good news on this with the Flynn effect and education and that attenuates it all, but the process of just making those connections is there. So here's some examples of some patternicities that are not true, false patterns. What do you see here? A horse, that's right, a horse head. Or, how about here? A cow, yes. Everybody seen the cow? There's a red line around it. Oh, you had just done it. Sorry. <laughs> of course you see it. Well, by putting the red line around it, that's uh, that's called priming, cognitive priming. You're priming the brain. Here's what you're going to see, and then go backwards. And and now it pops out even more. Uh, so this is just like exactly when the magician, you just have Randy here. You know, Randy says, here's what I'm going to do. Okay, he's lying, he's not gonna do that. But he's priming your brain to see something that he wants you to see, even though that's, that's the misdirection. But in any case, that's what our brains do. Magicians and Madison Avenue advertising people are way ahead of the cognitive <laughs> psychologists who are now just catching up. Uh, makes sense. So, how about this one? The Dalmatian dog. There he is, now go back. Of course, you see it again and again, the cognitive priming. How about here? Saturn. Buddha, Saturn. You see nothing. Well, that's good because there's nothing there. <laughs> but if you think you saw something, uh, see me afterwards because this is uh, actually a test of, of cognitive impairment and possible disease. No, just kidding. <laughs> this is actually an example from uh, an experiment done with uh, by putting subjects in conditions of uncertainty. And, and feelings of anxiety, they're more likely to see something, illusory patterns and random patterns like this. Uh, now often what we uh, are thinking about, um, a lot about, uh, determines what we see in random patterns. So, of course, because we're all environmentally sensitive, thanks to Al Gore and the environmental movement, save the whales, save the dolphins. You see the dolphins here, right? <laughs> so here's a dolphin, there's a dolphin. That's a dolphin tail there. <laughs> How about this? What do you see? Flip flop. How about this? Uh, you know what you're seeing. Shoes, of course. Right, somebody said flip flop. Have you seen this lecture before? <laughs> uh, so what, what, the, what the advertisers do in these kinds of cases, they crop, of course, close enough that it triggers a pattern you already have in your brain of another image that you know and I know what we're talking about. But of course, that, that's what always happens, uh, in, in which there's a close match between the information coming into the environment and what's already in your memory to match it. So like a deja vu experience, um, is the process of you have a whole set of memories in your in, stored and new information comes in that sort of matches and it kind of makes you feel like, ooh, that's a close match. Like, haven't we met? Don't I know? What, uh, uh, no, I don't know you. Or, yes, we have. Yeah. Or, it feels like I've been in this town before. Well, because there's only so many ways to design towns. They have a street, and they have the, you know, a gas station and the restaurant. You know, so you, you get the feeling like I've been here before, I know you, or I've seen you, or something like that. All that is is a kind of a pattern matching process that feels emotionally like there might be a thing. That's all it is. Uh, again, these ambiguous figures that flip-flop back and forth, you see the lamp, because again, we're environmentally sensitive. <laughs> or the impossible crate illusion. So now I'm going to kind of start talking about how we uh, deceive ourselves. How these patterns we find often trick our, our cognition, so we can't always trust ourselves. So the impossible crate illusion is the famous one where the board seemed to bend around, the back flips to the front, and the front flips to the back. And then, of course, you can say, well, it's easy to fool the brain in 2D. How about 3D? So here's the famous impossible crane illusion in 3D designed by my friend, the late great Jerry Andrus, who is a magician who specialized in creating three-dimensional illusions from 2D drawings. So here he is standing inside the impossible crate, which is pretty cool. Can you see how, can you see how it's done? No. Of course not. No. <laughs> So camera angles, everything, the photographer is way over there shooting across, so the boards appear to overlap with one another. That rope has a cable in it to make it look like it's bending at just the right. But even when I go backwards, you can see 
the illusion still exists. Again, because you have a whole set of uh, patterns in memory of every possible angle that there is. And there's only so many ways that the world bends the way it really does. So people that design tricks like this are basing it on the fact that your brain will see things consistently as certain all of our brains will. That's why the magician can trick all of us pretty consistently. Uh, this one won an award um, last uh, two years ago for the best illusion. There is a contest for the best illusion design of the year. Um, and so this is the Leaning Tower piece, and the illusion is it, it's not. It turns out the Leaning Tower is not leaning at all. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> this is the same photograph side by side. The illusion, of course, is that one of them appears to be leaning way more than the other one. And so you can actually see in the next slide the, the ruler going across there. So what's happening is you're matching this angle to this angle instead of this angle to that angle. On your retina, you're just making this comparison. It feels like this one's leaning far more to the right than that. And you can see it in the, in the effect with the next photograph. Yeah, so these are the same photographs side by side. You can see the people in there. And, uh, and so again, you're comparing the one angle on the inside with the other angle on the inside. And that is what's throwing you off. <laughs> so often what, uh, what we evolved to naturally see can be triggered by just three data points. In this case, we evolved to care deeply about faces, study faces, pay attention to faces, look at the emotional leakage of faces. We care about faces. There's an area in the, uh, well, I'll show you here in a second. Uh, so congratulations to the president for winning the second term today, yesterday, whatever day this is. Uh, now study that face for a second, and, and then you'll note one of them looks slightly odder than the other one. Which one looks a little weird? The one on the left, right. So go ahead and we'll rotate it, put the one on the left now on the right. <laughs> Again, another effect uh, of manipulating uh, your uh, facial recognition software, which occurs in this area of the brain, in the temporal lobe, just above the ears. It's called the fusiform gyrus. Uh, it involves two different cellular networks, one of which is a rapid-firing magnocellular pathway that just scans for faces. This is the one that just, you know, two dots in a, in a line, that, that's a face. The other one, the parvocellular pathway, it is slower processing and looks for details. Eyes, nose, ears, mouth, cheek, so forth. And so what happened there with the Obama thing upside down, you just scan it quickly, it's a face. Oh, it's President Obama. Oh, oh wait a minute. And then you start scanning the details. And, uh, so we know from like uh, research that's nicely written up by Oliver Sacks that people that have damage in that area have face blindness. They, they don't recognize other people. They don't even recognize themselves in the mirror, extreme cases. Uh, or if you have like a tumor pressing up against it, you'll see like cartoon faces. This is called the Charles Bonnet syndrome. And, uh, and, and so that's, so, so we know that facial recognition is hardwired into the brain. Evolution put it in there for good reasons. Uh, and, uh, and that's how, one way we know how the brain works is by when it goes wrong. Uh, here's the happy face, or just the face on Mars. This was photographed in 1976 by the Viking spacecraft. Uh, and then the ufologists got very excited about this. Martians are sending us signals. Look, they built these gigantic faces just for us to see. Uh, and so they lobbied uh, NASA and JPL to send a spacecraft there to take a close-up photograph of it, which they did. And there it is, up close. As you can see, it's an eroded mountain, but if you squint, if you squint, you can see the face pop back out again. And so by squinting, you're reducing the granularity of the data from fine grain to coarse grain, and that triggers your fusiform gyrus to go into facial recognition mode, and you see the face pop out a little bit more. Here's another one, the happy face on Mars. <laughs> another one. Uh, this is the uh, a valley in Canada, southern Canada. It's actually a sunken valley, even though it looks like it's puffing out, another illusion. It's about five miles across, it's a huge valley. Uh, that's the Indian Head Valley. Here's the uh, unhappy old man on the tree. See, there's his mouth, two eyes. And uh, this one, this next one, I, I don't, uh, can you see that one? The shadows on the ground. Here's my favorite. <laughs> it was actually discovered by a Tennessee baker in 1996. 
Greeks who had a laminate and charged people a couple bucks to come in and see the nun bun. Until he got a cease and desist letter from Mother Teresa's lawyer saying, the... Next one. Here's Our Lady of the Chicago Underpass. It's a water stain, of course, but you know, the deeply religious people and, and, and not so religious people, Satan loves you. <laughs> and then, uh, some, some people saw something deeply meaningful in this one. <laughs> I went to your big cathedral. Devin and I went to the big cathedral today, right down by the Playa Mayor, and they have a big statue of John Paul II out front. So I guess he's still popular. Uh, another one of my favorites is the Virgin Mary on a grilled cheese sandwich, which sold on eBay for $28,500. Only in America. Come on. We know how to do it right. Cheesy. Yes. Here it is up close. It really does look like a, a, a face. I don't know if it really looks like the Virgin Mary, because what does the Virgin Mary look like? Some people saw other faces like... Uh, I prefer Jane Russell. Uh, or as a touch, my mom. That's my mom. That's my mom when she was 17 years old in the 1940s. Wow, people don't look like that. <laughs> but if you look at Devin, see the kind of res <laughs> All right, sorry. And here's my other eight. Church that uh, that sold candles and uh, Dawkins and Randy and I went there on a on a good on a good Friday and, and you can see that people were there and they're in their uh, makes like crutches and canes to be healed. They put up a big crucifix there. It's quite huge. But we walked around the backside and whenever uh, we saw a sprinkler head, uh, it turns out Clearwater, Florida isn't. The water isn't clear at all. It's kind of mineralized and it stains. The windows where there's sprinklers and there's like a palm tree that creates that sort of odd shape. Uh, it's, in fact, we found on the backside another one uh, <laughs> that they started to wipe off because I guess you can only have one miracle per building. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see where the, the sprinkler is here and the palm tree that they cut down. So anyway, back to Hume's question of what's more likely uh, on a miracle. Uh, is it really a miracle of Mary or is it a miracle of art? <laughs> well, I'm not Catholic, but I am a Simpsons fan, so... <laughs> anyway, let's go back to our thought experiment. You're hopping out of the plains of Africa three and a half million years ago, and you hear a rustle in the grass. Is it a dangerous predator just the wind? What's the difference between a dangerous predator and the wind? The wind is an inanimate force. A dangerous predator is an intentional agent. So, I'm arguing that Something I call agentism, or you can call it something else, whatever. It's the tendency to infuse patterns of meaning, intention, and agency, often invisible beings, from the top down. So, uh, whether so, what I'm arguing is that not only do we find patterns that are incorrect, but we, we just find patterns all over the place, and the default position is assume they're real. But when a, a, an organism assumes that the predator. When you, when you assume a predator, you assume something about them. They have intention, and the intention is to eat me, and that can't be good. So note that even if they're not cognitively aware of this at all, which they, of course they aren't, but they're still making a, a, an assumption that the, this other thing has agency, free will, determinism, it's coming after me, it wants me, it has intention. It's, a, it's an active agent, and that's different than just like the wind or a rock or something like that. So souls, spirits, ghosts, gods, demons, angels, aliens, intelligent designers, governments, and spirits, and all manner of invisible beings with power and intention are believed to haunt our world and control our lives. I think it's the basis of animism, polytheism, monotheism. The intelligent designers always portrayed as this like 
super smart genetic engineer that comes down to earth and stirs the particles in such a way to create bacterial flagellum or blood clotting agents in blood or whatever the latest thing that creationists are into. Uh, but it's the same thing. It's you know coming from on high to make the step to create complex life or whatever. Or or even aliens. You know, if you think about it, aliens are always portrayed as these vastly superior technologically, scientifically, morally advanced beings coming down from on high to warn us or rescue us. Uh, how many of you have seen the 1951 film, The Day of the Earth Stood Still. This is really worth watching. It's a great film. Um, and it's, it's a Christ allegory. So in the film, the spaceship comes and, 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 and like, like they never do now, they, it lands at the White House. <laughs> and now they always land in Pucker Brush Field, you know, Farmer Bob's Field in Pucker Brush Field. It's always in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but here so it lands and, and uh, the Michael Rennie character, Clat 2 on the right, uh, his mission is to come to warn the earthlings about our sinful nature. We, we're really screwing up. In this case, it's nuclear war. It's the 1950s. So, uh, and he warns you know, He wants to warn the authorities, but they will, the, the authorities won't see him. So he mingles among the common people like Jesus does. His name, by the way, in the movie is Mr. Carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, he befriends uh, the Patricia Neal character, um, who is sort of the Mary Magdalene in the film. There's kind of this relationship, and it's never quite consummated, or is it? You know, just like in the real Jesus story, you know, did he or didn't he? You know, was he married? We have a story about that in, in the next issue of Skeptic because of that little fragment that was found last month, where, it's, where Jesus says to the disciples, and my wife, dot, 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 it's like, oh, what dot, dot, dot? You can't put an ellipsis there, but they didn't put an ellipsis there, it's just right. There was one like 20 years ago in which it was something like, and Jesus kissed her on her dot, dot, dot. Like, oh, what? <laughs> anyway, so he mingles with the common people. He befriends Patricia Neal character. Uh, and then the authorities track him down and kill him, just like with Jesus. They put him in the tomb. They put him in a jail cell in the movie uh, where he's just laid out. And then Patricia Neal has to go to Gork the robot and give him the command that she was told to give him, which was, anybody know this one? Science fiction fans? Gork Barada Nicktoo. You know, it's like, go get him and resurrect him. So the robot goes and gets the Michael Randy character out of the tomb and takes him back to the spaceship and brings him back to life with you know all kinds of little lights and spooky music and stuff like that. Uh, and, uh, and then in, in the movie, she says, you mean this is the power that, that science technology has in the future? And in the original script, he says, yes. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and the uh, Breen Censorship Board in America said, you can't say that, this is America, don't freak out. <laughs> so they had to rewrite it, and now he says, no, no, nobody has that kind of power except the great spirit in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really bad. And uh, so he's, he's resurrected, he's back to life, he goes and delivers his message uh, to everybody and says, you know, basically redeem yourself or else. And then he ascends, the ascension. He gets in the spaceship and takes off. But again, that's that whole theme that religions have, myths have, even science fiction has. Because it resonates, I think, deeply with this idea that there's invisible beings out there. Uh, it's, it's why we can uh, watch a movie like Freaky Friday. Uh, so there's elements to uh, agentism. One is dualism. We're natural born dualists. Most of us, from a very early age, uh, and we know from developmental psych uh, experiments that this begins at, at age two, maybe even age one, where the assumption is, is there's two things. There's corporeal and incorporeal. There's brain and mind. There's body and spirit or body and soul or something like that. So we can watch a movie like Freaky Friday where Lindsay Lohan and Jamie Lee Curtis switch bodies. And, and, and now the teenage girl is in the corporate boardroom and the middle-aged mom is in high school. And, Hilarity ensues. <laughs> uh, but we get the jokes, we get the humor, it's kind of fun, uh, because we understand intuitively that there must be something else in there that's not physical, that moves. Uh, but if you think about it for a second, you, you are just your brain. That, that, that's it. There's just brain. There's no mind. We use that word in a very fuzzy, uh, unscientific way. It's okay, because we have to talk. So, well, my mind. My mind was going today because of jet lag, something like that. But there is no mind because 
when you say that, it kind of reifies it into something like it's floating around up there, and if my brain died, it would still just float off somewhere else. Of course, we know this is not the case, for sure, because with Alzheimer's or dementia or stroke, when the neurons die, whatever they were doing is gone. The language function, the memory, with Alzheimer's, your memory just disappears. Everything gets smaller, just shrinks, the brain shrinks. Uh, and, and the memory shrinks, and even the gait shrinks, and their body kind of shrinks, and their handwriting shrinks. It, it's just gone. It doesn't go anywhere. Well, now my friend Deepak Chopra thinks it does go somewhere. <laughs> I asked him, where does Aunt Millie's mind go when her brain dies of Alzheimer's? And he had an answer. It, goes, it returns to the great quantum conscious ether where it began. Okay. And well, you call it the matrix. It's like a quantum matrix. Where, where do you get? The, where is this matrix other than Netflix on the movie? Uh, so, well, anyway, most scientists don't agree with that. There's no place to store your pattern. Now, this is something uh, that Ray Kurzweil, the futurists, are kind of working on. You can build a computer big enough and download all your memories, then then you can continue on. That, that's what they think. I don't think so. I think you'd still have the problem of identity still exists. And uh, so, so here's the thought experiment on that. So let's say uh, we've perfected cloning. So you, 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 you store a little piece of your DNA, some tissue at the cloning lab. And, and they've also figured out how to download every single neur neuronal connection, every synaptic connection, and so on, your whole pattern and, and you. In a, in a little time machine, a little back, you know, like Apple sells the time machines to back up your computer every week that you're supposed to do in case it crashes and you lose everything, but you have your little backup hard drive. So let's say you have a company that stores on their servers you. And so let's say you get on a trip and the plane goes down, you're wiped out. So they contact your spouse, your significant other, no problem. You call the cloning place, hey, build me another body of my sweetheart, and then you call the, you know, the backup hard drive company and put it in the brain of the clone, boom. And, uh, and, so, uh, and so your sweetheart, okay, you're back together, there, everything's fine, except the plane didn't actually go down. It, it, there was an error in reporting. The pilot pulled it out the last second and you survived. So you go home and there's, and there in your bedroom, <laughs> with your sweetheart is this other thing. It isn't you. You're you. Or are you you? Or there's two of you. Okay, you see the problem, the identity problem. So this is a whole interesting philosophical thing that I find interesting. But the point is we all get it because we're natural born dualists, even though there's no evidence like a, like a dualistic essence. And uh, my friend uh, Bruce Hunt, the cognitive psychologist, has actually run these experiments. Would you wear Hitler's jacket? He just asked subjects, would you wear it? Almost all of them say, oh, God. ooh, the evil would just sort of, you know, why? Because the evil would like somehow ooze into my body. As if the evilness is carried in the jacket. Or would you wear Mr. Rogers' sweater? Mr. Rogers is a very popular uh, children's television uh, host on uh, PBS. Uh, or what, uh, he actually put up for sale on eBay Brad Pitt's shirt. Would you wear Brad Pitt? What would you pay for Brad Pitt's shirt? Washed or unwashed? <laughs> Which one do you think got the higher price? Of course. You want the essence of Bradness. Oh, it's so <laughs> Now, there may be, there may be an evolutionary reason behind this. That is, we know from research on scent, uh, you know, the scent of your lover or you know, somebody that you have a relationship with triggers positive memories and positive feelings. Or on the other end of the spectrum, people that study disgust uh, and, and so bad smells that trigger the, the emotion of disgust, like it makes you want to vomit or something, uh, are always associated with disease vector carrying objects or substances. So it could be that we evolved this, so in, in connection with dualism, the essence of something really good or really bad is already there, and then you just add layers on it, you know, sort of spiritual soul soul stuff, that you layer on it. Now we know that uh, you can look for this in the brain. We can trigger it by uh, just electrically stimulating areas of the brain. This began with Wilder Penfield's 1963. Research with, these are almost always done with epileptic patients, so they voluntarily go in and have open brain surgery. 
Uh, they used to just cut the corpus callosum to stop the seizures from spreading from one hemisphere to the other. Now they actually go in and they place uh, monitoring electrodes in there to see where the seizures start exactly, so you can pinpoint which neurons to destroy so that seizures stop. Uh, and so anyway, they, they, they get permission from these patients to wake them up during the surgery and, and then poke around and ask questions. Pretty cool. And so this is how neuroscientists, one way neuroscientists map the brain to figure out what it's doing. You just poke and ask. Give it a little electrical stimulation. So a pen field and sense this has been replicated tons of times. Uh, you can trigger the feeling of the presence of others, hearing music, angelic voices, intense meaningfulness, uh, talking to God, and so on. Then there's another line of research that I have a whole section in my book about the sense presence effect, in which people under extreme conditions, uh, these are like uh, K2 and, uh, and, and Everest climbers, high altitude climbers, uh, solo sailors, uh, long distance uh, cyclists, uh, the dog mushers and the Iditarod. So mostly when people are alone, extremely tired, fatigued, exhausted, sleep deprived, hungry, but mainly alone, uh, they, they, they sense that there's somebody next to them. And, and interestingly, if you're left-handed, it tends to be on the right side, and if you're right-handed, it tends to be the person, the visible person's on the left side. So obviously, it's a neural thing. Triggered by what? I don't know. It's not just oxygen deprivation, because it happens to sailors on the sea. So it's just something that our brains do under different conditions to, to construct another you. Well, another presence, a something. And, and so how, wherever the self is located in the brain, and we don't know, uh, there can't be two selves. So if it triggers another sense of self, you're going to think, well, there's me, and then there's this other thing outside of me. Uh, just like people that hear voices, schizophrenics who hear voices, they really just, the voices really are outside of them, even though we know they're not. So the brain, because the brain can't sense itself. So anything that's artificially stimulated, like LSD or whatever, you just think it's out there. That's why people that have experiences like that really strongly believe, passionately believe, that it actually happened out there in the world. It's not just in my head. And so I wrote about one who's a friend of mine, but uh, who had these, one of these experiences. He heard the voice of God, talk to, or something, talk to him. And, and even though he knows all about this, he's read all about it, he's read my stuff, and all the neuroscience, and Oliver Sacks, and all that. Yes, yes, I know, I know, I know, but mine was different. It's <laughs> like, check they all say that. He goes, I know they all say that, but mine really is different. <laughs> I know, but you know, they also say, I know, but... Uh, yeah, okay. That's the power of belief. Uh, you can go deeper into the amygdala and hippocampus, and again, trigger these deep emotional feelings, hyper-religiosity, uh, meaningful, meaningfulness, depersonalization, connection or, with God and the cosmos. And near-death experiences, we know a lot about this now. These are always trotted out as the uh, drop-dead best argument for the afterlife. Uh, even though there's lots of ways to duplicate these things, for example, this fellow, uh, James Wintery, is a uh, United States Air Force uh, physician who's, who works with pilots. So what pilots do for part of their training is they, they get inside this machine, it's a centrifuge, it spins them around until they black out. So they're getting a hypoxia, oxygen deprivation. What happens is you spin around the blood it's pressed to the center of your brain and your cortex just shuts down. And a significant percentage of them have an out-of-body experience. They report, you know, I was floating out of my body and I passed through this tunnel and there was a white light at the end of the tunnel and, and so forth. And you know they're not going anywhere because you can see that they're just sitting there, uh, they're drooling, you know, they're, they're out. They're out. <laughs> he called this G-force loss of consciousness or, or, or uh, and it's a type of out-of-body near-death experience. You can do it through stimulation. This is another epileptic uh, patient in, uh, published in The Lancet in 2003 by Swiss neuroscientists that uh, had a um, had a patient, uh, they woke her up and they poked around at that red dot there on her temporal lobe. And she floated and she was going to report, oh, I'm way up by the ceiling now. You know, they cranked it up and they cranked it back down. Oh, okay, I'm just I'm coming back down. Now they touch around. <laughs> oh, now my left leg is up. Oh, now my right leg. And, you know, of course, she's just lying there, but she's reporting all these things just by touching her. Um, and, and again, with alien abductions, we now know that this is something called sleep paralysis. And, uh, and in fact, uh, several centuries ago, the English referred to nighttime sensations of chest pressure from witches or other supernatural beings as mare, from Anglo-Saxon marin to crush. So a nightmare was the crusher who comes in the night. 
the accounts of these middle age uh, uh, abductions of types, but they weren't alien abductions. They were they were demonic beings. But of course, they lived in a demon haunted world. We live in an alien haunted world. So, uh, people that have these uh, these kinds of lucid dreams. So here here's how it works. If you if you go to skeptic.com, you type in sleep paralysis. We have a long article by a woman that had about 20 years of sleep paralysis experiences, and now she's a big skeptic, and she knows what happens, and still describes, you know, it's like, I fall asleep, and then in my, in my dream, I wake up. And she says, now I, I now know I was asleep, but, I'm, but the dream is that I'm awake. And in the, uh, uh, this creature comes in, it's like this big amorphous, dark, faceless creature, that then over the years developed facial features, and it became an like, alien life and so on. Now, of course, your culture is telling you what to call it, what details to fill in. And so our, our collective memories are filled with science fiction images, and, and we've all seen the Whitney Stryver book cover of the alien. That's where that began, as the artist drew these sort of almond-shaped eyes with a, with a uh, thin, emaciated body. And, and so that's the image that, that's been burned into all of our collective memories now. Before the 1980s, there were all sorts of aliens from around the world. There's, you can look at uh, old books by Martin Gardner and other early skeptics of describing what aliens were like from all over the world. You know, Swedes had these tall, blonde, blue-eyed aliens, for example. Now all the aliens look the same, thanks to popular culture. So it's just a neural phenomenon. It's nothing more than a, a kind of aberration of sleep. Uh, you can do it through the God Helmet. This is uh, Michael Persinger's research at uh, Laurentian University in Sudbury, Canada. That's him up in the right. And uh, so he calls it the God Helmet. You put this helmet on, and it has these solenoids on the side, and they bombard your temporal lobes uh, with these electromagnetic fields. It's harmless, I hope. Because <laughs> I did it. And uh, I had, you know, sort of, sort of a sense presence and maybe a slight little out-of-body experience. It's hard to say because it's a subtle effect. Uh, but he's had other people that have much stronger effects. M my problem is, is I think about it too much. It's like I used to be able to get hypnotized, but now that I know a lot about hypnotism, it's like trying to fall asleep by lying there going, fall asleep, fall asleep, fall asleep. You can't. It's like, don't think of the pink elephant there in the room. Like, okay. So. Oh, there it goes. He's disappearing. <laughs> uh, while we're fixing that, if somebody can get me a glass of water, that'd be great. Oh, I have water. Thank you. My time's up. <laughs> examples is that we all have the same brains essentially the neural physiology is the same for all of us so you can get similar experiences triggered by different <laughs> stimuli so when you hear somebody come up with something new like oh I had this really incredible experience it wasn't like this one or that one that doesn't mean anything it, 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 there could be there could be two dozen ways to trigger these kinds of uh, experiences so the larger point is that uh, belief all belief is mediated by the brain there's just the brain there's no mind and again, and I'll extrapolate on that a little bit, there's no such thing as the paranormal or the supernatural either. Um, by definition, there's just the normal, the natural, and the stuff we can't explain. But by definition, I mean, in science, we employ something called methodological naturalism. We just assume natural explanations. And if it is, by definition, outside of nature, supernatural, then we can't measure it. So I just apply this to anything, including God. There's no way we can determine if there's a God or not if God is a supernatural being. Now, of course, all believers think, yes, that's, that's correct. But he reaches in and does things in our world. In that case, then we can say, well, can I measure that? Can I study that? Can we photograph that? You know, something, because if, if the supernatural being outside of our space and time reaches into our world to throw the particles, to cure the cancer from answering prayer, to help the football team win the game, or win the, help the country win the war, whatever you're praying for. Somehow that must be a measurable thing. And if it's measurable, then we should be able to measure it if it's happening, because we're good at that now. And so far, nada. So there's no evidence for this. So the, the last resort of, well, it's a, it's a being outside of space and time that's supernatural, that doesn't cut it, because 
we can't know anything about that. So even like the paranormal, you know, people that believe in the paranormal, I believe in the paranormal. What do you mean by the paranormal? And so this is the problem. It's just a linguistic placeholder for something we don't understand. It's like when cosmologists talk about dark energy and dark matter. They don't mean that as an answer. That's not an explanation for anything. It, they're just words that they use to talk until we figure out what it is that's holding galaxies together and causing galaxies to do this and stars to do that. And so that's the answer when somebody says, oh, I, you know, I believe, what do you mean by the paranormal? Well, you know, it's beyond the normal. No, they're just the normal <laughs> and stuff we don't understand. So even if Deepak Chopra's right, and there's some spooky quantum effect where, uh, well, I'll give you the, the explanation. So he thinks that, uh, not just him, but there, there's a bunch of people that think this in his camp. A bunch, like six. <laughs> but they're physicists. This is how it works. Uh, as a little side thing here. So you go to a Deepak conference, and he's got like six PhD quantum physicists. These are people at, at legitimate universities, and they agree with Deepak. And, and he's got a room, you know, a thousand people in the room, and they're listening to these, you know, here's so-and-so from MIT, and here's so-and-so from this university, and he's a quantum physicist, and he says there's quantum spooky effects and mind really exists out there, and, and we can read each other's minds and all this stuff. And I always point out to the audience, these are the only six in the whole world who agree with Deepak. There's, you know, 5,000 physicists. Not one of them agrees with, you know, this is the problem. It's like the one and only holdout for climate denial. This guy at MIT, Richard Lind Lindzen, he's on every news story every night. You know, here's the climate scientist from Caltech, Harvard, Stanford, you know, whatever. And here's Richard Lindzen, the last one. And of course, the viewing audience is like, oh, so there's, you mean it's an equal debate? No, it isn't. <laughs> that's, that's, a little, that's a little problem. So let's say Deepak's right, and these guys are right, and that if I think certain thoughts, my neurons fire in such a way, that the collapse of the wave function inside the atoms, inside my neurons, uh, go out through my skull and into your skull and cause your neurons to fire in the same way, and so you can read my mind. But let's say, I, this is, I don't believe this, but let's say it turned out that was the case. That would not be the paranormal, it wouldn't be ESP, it wouldn't be spooky anything, it would just be physics. It would be like quantum neuropsychophysics or something like that. It would just, you see what I'm saying? It would just become part of science. There is no, you know, parascience or paranormal. It's just science and then everything we haven't explained yet. Okay. So, uh, so I'm going to finish up here and then we'll take some questions with just a couple of fun examples. So here I need the, uh, the audio. Yes. Yeah. So we're going to try to see if this works. Some of you have probably seen this before. It's a pretty famous example. So go to the next slide. So what I'm going to do is, this is back to the priming effect. So I'm going to play a portion of a song for you forward with the words on the screen. Then I'll play that same portion for you backwards without the words on the screen and see if you can hear the hidden messages. If you've already seen this, don't blurt it out. Uh, and, uh, and then I'll play it for you. Okay, go. forward, uh, actually. So when I was in high school, this was a deeply meaningful. By the way, there are some things you should not be skeptical of. This is the greatest rock song of all time. <laughs> so I think if you hit it once, and then once again, it'll play backwards. Yeah, down. Forward, yeah. And then hit once again. Here it is backwards without the words on the screen. Listen for the hit message. Do the same thing again, once, uh, once, and then once again, and then one last time. So here's the real message. <laughs>
World Conference a few years ago, in which people were saying that you know they heard all kinds of things when they walk around spooky places. So I played this for them. And not only did this not convince them that you know cognitive priming was that word power of expectation. No, no. Oh, you mean they actually have secret hidden methods like that? <laughs> You're missing the point here. Our brains find these things if you tell the brain what to expect. So uh, I'm going to finish up here with just the confirmation bias. Uh, this is the mother of all cognitive biases, the tendency to find confirming evidence what you already believe and ignore the disconfirming evidence. Everybody does it in all walks of life, religion, politics, economic policy, all your beliefs, we all do this. The moment uh, you believe something, you start to search for evidence to fit. It's a big problem in the criminal justice system. You know, Once the police have determined that you know, you're the guy, uh, then, then everything we see will be filtered through that and we'll just ignore all the, the disconfirming evidence and so on. Uh, but of course, this is how uh, psychics and tarot card readers, palm readers, uh, and mediums uh, work. Uh, you, you, have you seen these mediums that talk to the dead? Right? Okay, so here's the, here's the deal. Anybody can talk to the dead. It's not hard. It's getting the dead to talk back. That's the hard part. <laughs> so the confirmation bias will help you by doing cold readings in which you just uh, rattle off a whole bunch of stuff. Cold, cold you just read somebody cold. And, uh, and they'll only remember the hits. So, and you can actually get uh, a number of hits through some tried and true methods. So if you do a reading on people, just start off very broad and positive. Like, you know, I sense that you're a very intelligent, thoughtful person, that you have a good sense of humor, people enjoy your company. Uh, you know, you know, what's the response gonna be? No, you know, that's just not me. <laughs> uh, and then you just start to narrow and, and, and focus down a little bit more. And, like, I'm sensing that, uh, do you have like a scar on one of your knees? Could be from childhood, maybe? Wow, that's incredible. Uh, and, and there's something about, uh, he's telling me something about a red dress. Is there something about a red dress in your life? <laughs> At some point, any time, a white car. Maybe something about a white car, I don't know what this means. And, and you, just, you just go on and on. There's a book on how to do this with like 300 different little lines you can that turned out to be fairly accurate for a lot of people, enough people that you'll get a good half a dozen to a dozen hits in a half hour reading. Confirmation bias, no problem, they'll remember that. You know, I'm getting, a, I'm getting an R name, an R name, R is coming things like Robin, Robert, Richard, and you just, you know, and then the person will blurt it out. You know, oh, it's Robert, Robert was my father who passed away. It's like, don't, don't tell me who it is, I'm getting a strong father paper. <laughs> credit for all the hits and, and then afterwards they'll just say oh, that's incredible you got this and this and this and this how do you explain that so your answer as a skeptic is wait how do you explain the 237 misses <laughs> because in science we have to keep track of all the hits and the misses not just the handful of hits because of course by chance and good cold rating techniques that, that they will so we'll put all this together in a final thing like look at the priming effects confirmation bias and then finally expectation violation so expectation violation is based on pattern. So you find a pattern A, B, C, D, E happens. You expect F to happen when it doesn't. Whoa, you're surprised. It's funny if the, if the comedian surprises you with that. If, if the magician does something different, the magician says. And a final video clip here, sort of tying all these together on, on the power of expectation and violation. So, yeah, so here, yeah, I've got a, a, a here, and then 